Well, good morning to you guys. Y'all doing okay today? Good. Uh, well, like Cameron said, my name is Brad Holcomb. Uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm a little bit, tiny bit hoarse, um, so allergies are really, really bad in West Texas compared to what they are in Dallas. So it just hit me like a brick yesterday. But um, I'm, I'm super uh, uh, happy to be here, and, and it's always such a humbling thing when uh, Pastor Kurt asked if I would come back and have the opportunity to share it until the first service. When you're in seminary uh, environment all the time, <clears throat> You're just constantly being filled with all this Bible stuff, and, and you just get, you get so excited, and you really don't have an outlet to, to regurgitate that stuff. So I told the first service, it's like my opportunity to just vomit all that information out uh, for 30 minutes onto you guys. So uh, you get to alleviate some of that for my wife, who has to hear it all the time. So um, anyways, I, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I, I'll be in John chapter 9, if you guys have your Bible. Um, and I'm going to be reading this morning from a version of the Bible called the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, or if any of you guys have an HCSB, uh, it would be really similar to that. But whatever version you have, if you'll go ahead and open up to John chapter 9, or you can uh, get there on your phone. Um, I'm going to read through the whole chapter, uh, which is 41 verses. And uh, if any of you guys know me or, or have ever heard me teach, I tend to, to lean more toward the three to five verses at a time. Uh, so when Kurt asked me to preach on John chapter nine, it was very stressful and overwhelming for me. So uh, 41 verses. <clears throat> what I want to do is um, I, I want to read through the passage with you because it's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful story. And uh, Kurt has been leading you through um, uh, parts of the gospel of John through the seven miracles of Jesus um, over the last several weeks leading up to, like Cameron said, the ultimate miracle, which is the res resurrection of Christ, which is our hope, right, is, is that Christ is not dead, but he's alive. Um, and that's who we worship. And so um, this is one of those miracles. And so uh, I, I want to... Uh, I want to go ahead and read it, um, and then I want to just drive home one point from the story. So when you walk away today, I don't want you to get 41 different sermons uh, from every verse of the story, but to get one point from the story, okay? So I want to read it, I want to give you that point, and then I want to pray briefly, and then we'll get into it, okay? So John chapter 9, verse 1 says this, As he, that being Jesus, was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. We must work, we must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. After he said these things, he spit on the ground, made some mud from the saliva, and spread the mud on his eyes. Go, he told the man, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he left, washed, and he came back seeing. His neighbors and those who had seen him <clears throat> before as a beggar said, isn't this the one who used to sit begging? Some said, he is the one, but others said, no, but he looks like him. The man kept saying, I am the one. So they asked him, then how are your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes, and told me to go to Siloam and wash so when I went and washed, I received my sight. Where is he, they asked. I don't know, the man said. Verse 13. They brought the man who used to be blind to the Pharisees. The day that Jesus made the mud and opened the eyes was a Sabbath. Then the Pharisees asked again to the man how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, he told them. I washed and I can see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a sinful man perform such signs? And there was a division among them. Again, they asked the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He is a prophet, the man said. The Jews did not believe this about him, that he was blind and received his sight, until they summoned the parents of the one who had received his sight. They asked them, is this your son, the one who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? We know this is our son and that he was born blind, his parents answered, but we don't know now how he sees and we don't know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age and he will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jews, since the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him as the Messiah, he would be banned from the synagogue. This is why his parents said he is of age, ask him. So a second time they summoned the man who had been born, who had been blind and told him, give glory to God. We know, we know that this man is a sinner. That man being Jesus is who they're referring to. So the man answered, whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind and now I can see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And the man said, I already told you and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? 
They, I know, it's pretty funny. Uh, they ridiculed him. You're the man's disciple, but we're Moses' disciples. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but this man, we don't know where he's from. And then the man says this. This is an amazing thing. The man told them, you don't know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, God listens to them. Throughout history, no one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he would not be able to do anything. Then the Pharisee said, you were born entirely in sin, and you're trying to teach us, and they threw him out, threw him out of the synagogue. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown out the man, and when he found him, he asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? It's the most important question any of us could ever answer on this side of heaven. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him, he asked. So Jesus answered, you have seen him, and in fact, he is the one speaking with you. I believe, Lord, the man said, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see and those who do see will become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and asked him, we aren't blind too, are we? If you were blind, Jesus told them, you wouldn't have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. That verse kept me awake at night. That's a confusing verse. So let's pray. And uh, if you guys will join with me and ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand what this passage is saying. Father, we come to you and we pray that your spirit would enlighten our hearts and our minds to understand uh, this passage. What a beautiful story, God, Um, to be reminded that you open the eyes of those who are blind. Um, God, you're not just a miracle worker. Um, The the miracles are not just for us to be amazed at. They're, They're to point us to you, God. And so help us to see you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the, the point that I want to make to you, I'll give you the title of the sermon, then I want to give you the point, and I'm going to explain where I got the point from, okay? So the title of the sermon is simply this, that Jesus heals the blind. Jesus heals the blind. Okay, and the point of the sermon that, that I want to communicate, or that I hope to communicate to you, is, is what I believe is the thrust of the entire story in John chapter 9, and it's simply this, that through this miracle we see that Jesus is the light of the world, who came to bring sight to our spiritual blindness so that we might live as children of light. I'll read it one more time. That through this miracle, we see that Jesus is the light of the world who came to bring sight to our spiritual blindness so that we might live as children of light. Okay, and I get this point from two verses, one at the beginning of the, of the chapter and one at the end. At the beginning of the chapter in verse five, uh, Jesus says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus makes this claim about himself. And then in verse 39, at the end of the chapter, Jesus says, I came into the world for judgment. So in verse five, we get a picture of who Jesus is. And then in verse 39, we get a picture of what he came to do. He is the light of the world. And then in verse 39, he says, I came into the world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see and those who do see will become blind. Who Jesus is, what Jesus came to do. He is the light of the world who came Uh, into the darkness in order to give sight to the blind so that we might live as children of light. Okay, to understand this, to understand uh, chapter nine and the significance of chapter nine and what we're gonna lead up to, um, I I always say this because this has been really impactful for my own personal walk with Jesus. It's always important for us uh, us to understand context. Okay, context is very important in the Bible and because we, we have this tendency, and it's, it's not from ill will or anything like that. I, I, sometimes I do this. <clears throat> Excuse me. We take one verse out of the Bible that we really like, and uh, we put it on a rug or you know, a quilt or a coffee mug. Or, and, and that's not bad, um, but we have a tendency to not understand the context that surrounds that verse. And, and 100% of the time, when we understand the context that surrounds a verse, it always means so much more than you thought it originally meant. Like Jeremiah 29, 11 is a beautiful verse, but it means so much more than God wants you to have happy circumstances. We know that not to be true because we've all in the room experienced that, that circumstances are not always happy, and if our joy is contingent upon our circumstances, we're going to live a life of misery. Okay? So um, it's, it's important for us, for us to understand what, what John is saying in chapter 9. We need to go back into John chapter 8. Okay? And here's what's happening in John chapter 8. If you guys will flip back one chapter with me. John chapter 8, starting in verse 12, Jesus is going to introduce himself as the light of the world. Okay, he says this, Jesus spoke to them again and he said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Okay, Jesus is a very exclusive teacher. He's saying, I am the only way. There's no other way but me. 
And so he says, I am the light of the world. Anybody who comes to me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is what he introduces himself as. And what's significant about this is if you read back into previous chapters, we're not going to go throughout uh, the first nine chapters. We don't have time for that. But if you read back into the first nine chapters in John chapter one, the very beginning of the book, we see John say something that is a continuing theme throughout the book of John. My, uh, my Greek professor uh, that makes me sound so much smarter than I actually am. I'm not doing very well in Greek. But my, my Greek professor is a John scholar. So he's written commentaries on the book of John, Revelation. So I was like, I'm going to go ask him uh, what I should say about this. And so, so I went up to him after class and, and I said, can you give me, don't, don't give me the answer. Just give me a hint <clears throat> of what the book of John is about. Uh, and, and he said, I, I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm just going to tell you that I want you to go back and study light and darkness throughout John's writings. <clears throat> It'd be a good Bible study for you. Um, to, to look into John's writings, the book of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the book of Revelation, and, and to study the, the difference between light and darkness and the relationship of the two as it pertains to Jesus. Very significant. So John chapter 1, John says this, in the beginning was the Word. Okay, we all know this passage, but think about the, the theological richness of this and pertaining to who Christ is. In the beginning was the Word, who is Jesus. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him. That means Jesus is the creator of all things. And apart from him was not anything made that was made. And then he says this, in him was life and that life was the light of men. Okay, so we have this idea that in Jesus is life and in Jesus is the light. He is the light. Okay, then we jump to John chapter three, verse 19 through 21. He says this, um, Jesus, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. So over and over, we see this idea that Jesus is the light. And so when we make it to John chapter eight, he simply introduces himself as such. I am the light of the world. And if we move down, we see that, that he's talking to a group of Pharisees. We're going to talk about the Pharisees in a few minutes, but the Pharisees were simply the religious leaders of the day. They were like the celebrity pastors of the day. Everybody went to the Pharisees for, for spiritual advice. If, if they had problems in their relationships and their marriage and understanding parts of the Bible, they went to the Pharisees. They were, they were the teachers at the time. So Jesus is talking to the Pharisees in chapter 8, and it says in verse 13, after Jesus says that he is the light of the world, verse 13 says... So the Pharisees said to him, you are not testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not valid. That, that's very simply what the Pharisees conclude about who Jesus is. Your testimony about yourself is not valid. We cannot argue in the Bible that Jesus did not claim to be God. We can't. Okay, one of my really good friends from, from Fort Worth is not a believer. And my wife and I have conversations with her often. And, and she over and over will say, Jesus did not say he's God. Yes, he did. He did. And so, so Jesus makes this claim throughout the Bible, and, and the Pharisees immediately say, uh, your claim of yourself is not valid. And so all throughout chapter 8, leading into chapter 9, we see this really, really sad conversation go on between Jesus and the Pharisees and the religious leaders, in which Jesus is pleading with these men who knew the Bible. They, they knew all of the Old Testament by memory. They knew that the Bible pointed to a coming Savior of the world, and they missed him. They missed him. He was right in front of their face going like this and they couldn't see him. And so Jesus over and over again says, if you don't turn and believe in me, you will die in your sin. You will die in your sin. Over and over again, we see this in the Pharisees repeatedly, your testimony is not valid. Your testimony is not valid. Until finally at the end of chapter eight, Jesus makes another claim that he himself is God and the Pharisees begin to pick up stones to stone him and Jesus gets away. And so now we land at chapter nine in which this conversation has happened. The Pharisees have attempted to kill Jesus, but by the grace and the sovereignty of God, obviously that wasn't gonna happen because we knew what Jesus' fate was, right? To die on the cross for our sins, not at the hands of a group of Pharisees. Um, and so uh, Jesus gets away, and then in chapter nine, uh, he, he begins to walk by, and in verse one says, he was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. He saw a man blind from birth. Now the man couldn't see, I mind you, right? But Jesus saw, Jesus saw the man before the man could see Jesus, is very significant. Jesus saw a man blind from birth. Uh, it says his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Okay, the disciples are gonna ask Jesus uh, a really important theological question about suffering that I think all of us, myself included, have a very hard time understanding. That when something happens, 
Okay, when there's a disability, when there's a tragedy, when, when something goes wrong uh, in our circumstances, in our life, we have a tendency to think that there's some formulaic inc- equation that produced that. A plus B equals C. I did this, he did this, that's why this happened, right? And so, so what the disciples were doing and the way that they had been taught was that uh, disability, blindness, tragedy, suffering, all of those things were a product of individual sin only, that those things were a product of individual sin only, meaning that either the man had to sin or his parents had to sin. One of the two had to produce the man's blindness, but Jesus is gonna give them a totally different perspective on this that's absolutely life-changing, and he says neither, neither. It wasn't the man's sin, it wasn't his parents' sin, but it was so that God's works may be manifest in him. The man was blind for the glory of God. Okay, the man was blind for this very moment in his life, and the man was blind for you and I so that you and I could see this story and we could see that what Jesus is about to do in healing this man says something very significant about who he is and what he came to do for you and for me. We, we need not, whenever we counsel one another, to confuse individual sin with original sin. Does that make sense to you guys? Original sin is what we get from Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter one and two, we read that God created the world and he created all things good because he is a good God and out of the overflow of who, who he is and his nature, he lovingly created all things. God didn't need to create in order to be satisfied or fulfilled, um, but God did because he loves and he's gracious and he's good. And so he created a good creation. He created a good relationship with man, uh, between man and woman and between man and woman and God. Okay, there was no insecurity. There was no shame. There was no fear. There was no sin. There was no death at the time. And then by the time we make it to Genesis chapter three, this is the, this is the storyline of the Bible, by the way. By the time we make it to Genesis chapter three, uh, we read uh, that man and woman traded the satisfaction and the fullness of joy that they had in their relationship with God for pride and for self-sufficiency. And so they turned from their good creator. They turned from him. And as they turned from him, we read that, that all of God's good creation from that point on throughout the Bible is fractured. Okay? You and I live in a time in which a lot of people like to call the already and the not yet. Already has Jesus come and lived a perfect life, died on the cross, paying the penalty for all of our sin, and rising from the dead victorious over that sin and justifying us in his resurrection. Jesus has already done that, and he has already ascended back to the Father, in which he sits at his right hand, ruling and reigning over all creation, awaiting his return, but he's yet to return, meaning that you and I still live in a broken and fallen world. We still live in a world ridden with sin. We still live in a world where mass shootings happen and bombings on front porches happen and uh, there's political scam and all sorts of things. We live in that world. We live in a world filled with cancer and sickness and divorce and, and all sorts of brokenness. We live in that world. Not yet has Christ come back and reconciled all things back to himself, but he will. He will. And so, so we live in this time of waiting. And so Jesus is saying, it's not a matter of the man's sin or the parent's sin. It's, it's, this is a matter of the glory of God. What I'm about to do in this man's life is for the glory of God. It's so that God's works might be manifested. So we continue to read. He says, we do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Okay, so Jesus... In this first section um, that that describes the miracle itself, Jesus is very simply going to communicate to us in his healing the blind man that he is the light of the world. Okay, Jesus is the light of the world who who came to give sight to those who are blind. The miracle itself, he he, uh, reaches down, he spits in the dirt, he makes mud, he rubs it in the man's eyes, tells him to go off and wash uh, in the pool. And I wish I had time to get into all the details of this, but we don't. He goes off to wash in the pool, and uh, the man comes back seeing, miraculously seeing. He had never seen in his life. Three months ago, I, uh, about three months ago, um, I was on my way to work the night before. Little co- I had slept in my contacts. <clears throat> never do that. And uh, I had slept in my contacts, and so the whole way to work, I was like, <clears throat> I'll be fine. I'll be fine. They, they kind of irritated me a little bit, but it, was, it wasn't anything I hadn't experienced before. So I made it to work, and progressively throughout the day, I could feel my, my eyes beginning to, to hurt more, so much so that I was like, I don't know if I can drive home, but I tried, and, um, which was dumb. And so I, I got in my truck, and I proceeded to go to drive down I-35 to get home. It takes about 20 minutes, and uh, halfway there, I couldn't see. I mean, my eyes progressively just shut, so much so to the point where I had one eye opened as I was driving like 35 miles an hour down I-35. And uh, by the grace of God, I made it home. I didn't 
hurt myself or anybody else. And, uh, and, and I got home and for three days I couldn't see. I mean, I, I couldn't really open my eyes. Um, and so by like day three, uh, my wife and I were like, we, we need to go to the doctor. So we went to the doctor and uh, he kind of, you know, he forced my eyes open, shined a little light in there. And he said, I'm gonna apply a, a steroid to your eye just so we can open it up. What had happened was my contact lens had scratched my cornea. And so my eyeballs were swollen. All right, yeah, it's nasty. My eyeballs were swollen, and, uh, and so after he applied the ointment, though, slowly they just they opened back up. And even though I didn't have my contacts in at the time, I could see for the first time in three days. And, and I don't have any idea, nor do many of us, what, what this man experienced throughout the duration of his life. He never saw. Can you imagine? He never saw the faces of his loved ones. He, he never saw his surroundings. He never saw color. He never saw. And for the first time in his life, some obscure first century Jewish carpenter comes up to him and and he spits in the dirt and he picks up the dirt and he rubs it in the man's eyes and he can see for the first time. He can see color, he can see his friends and his neighbors, he can see, right? And and so we we read this and then the friends start to freak out and they're like, who healed you? And he's like, I don't know, is this guy named Jesus, but I don't really know anything about him. And so by that time, the friends uh, in, in natural freak out mode are like, well, we're gonna take him to the Pharisees. We're gonna take him to the Pharisees because they're the ones that are gonna help us make sense of kind of what's going on. So they take the man to the Pharisees. Now here's what I wanna do with the remainder of our time in the passage because there's a whole lot to read is, is simply this. I wanna draw out uh, two, um, two primary groups of people that we're gonna see illustrated in the remainder of John chapter nine. Okay, two, two primary groups of people. And, and the... the a uh, thing that I want us to focus on is what Jesus says at the end of the chapter in verse 39. Okay, remember we talked about that at, at the beginning. Jesus says this in verse 39. He says, I came into the world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see and those who see will become blind. So here's what I wanna do with the rest of the text. There, there are two different, ki- two different types of blindness that Jesus is talking about as we're gonna, we're gonna see illustrated. There's one type of blindness that's illustrated by the Pharisees. As we read about the interaction between the Pharisees and the man and the Pharisees and the man's parents, um, they, are one, they, they represent one type of blindness, okay? And then the other type of blindness is gonna be illustrated by the man, the man who was once blind, but now he could see. And here's, here's, how, those, here's how those two different types of blindness break down. The first is uh, those who are blind by self-righteousness. All of us in the room are gonna fall into one of these two categories or both. Those who are blind by self-righteousness, that's gonna be illustrated by the Pharisees. And the second group of people um, illustrated by the man are going to be those who are blind, but through faith in Christ see. Those who are blind due to self-righteousness. And then the second, as illustrated by the man, those who are blind, but by the grace of God through faith in Christ can see. Does that make sense? I, I believe that's what Jesus is getting at in verse 39 that they're, everybody's blind, everybody's blind. But there are two primary uh, kinds of blindness. So, so we'll get into the first, those who are blind through self-righteousness as illustrated by the Pharisees. Something really important for us to understand about the Pharisees is that we all know they're the bad guys of the Bible, right? Anybody who reads the New Testament knows that uh, it wasn't the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the rapists and the murderers and, and all those types of people who uh, were bashing Jesus all throughout the duration of his three-year ministry. It was the religious people. It's very convicting, okay? But it was the religious people who put him forth to be crucified because he was claiming himself to be God. He was claiming himself to be the Savior and the Messiah, Right? And, and so we know them from our vantage point to be the bad guys of the Bible. What, what I do, I don't know if you guys can relate to this, what I do is I have a tendency to always side with the blind man. And to say, I'm like the blind guy. I didn't see, God made me, and I'm gracious, and I'm merciful, and I'm not hyper-religious. And I, I do that all the time. And so even as I was studying this passage, uh, I, I found myself doing that, and the Holy Spirit just like pulled kind of a 180 on my heart to help me see that I so often fall into the pharisaical category of this. Self-righteous. Here's a quote about the Pharisees, okay? It's from a guy named uh, Larry Osborne. He wrote a book called Accidental Pharisees. So if you ever want to uh, not get your feet stepped on but crushed, uh, you should read Accidental Pharisees because it will mess up your life in a good way. Um, He says this. He says, today when most of us hear the word Pharisee, we conjure up images of hypocritical, narrow-minded, puffed-up spiritual losers. 
what we think when we think of Pharisees. But in Jesus' day, being called a Pharisee was a badge of honor. It was a compliment, not a slam. That's because first century Pharisees excelled in everything we admire spiritually. They were zealous for God, completely committed to their faith. They were theologically astute, masters of the biblical texts. They obeyed even the most obscure commands. They even made up extra rules just in case they were missing anything. Their embrace of spiritual disciplines was second to none. Yes, they could be harsh and arrogant at times, but most of their contemporaries took it in stride. After all, the Pharisees had earned the right to boast and look down on everyone else. They were paying the price no one else was willing to pay. That's, that's who the Pharisees were. They were just really, really religious people that were really excited about God. But they missed the Messiah. I, I heard a pastor one time say that, that we can read the Bible in one of two ways. We can read it like a pair of binoculars in which we look through the text and we see everyone else's problems and sin. Or we can read it as a mirror in which the Holy Spirit through the word of God dissects our heart and shows us our wickedness and our need and our sin and our depravity. That, that all sounds really depressing until you begin to realize that Christ came to die for that, right? Christ came to cleanse that. He came for the sinner. He came for those who are far away. He came for those who had no hope and knew they had no hope. He came for the broken. That's why Christ came. And, and so the Pharisees had this tendency to read the Bible in this way, okay? It was everyone else's sin. And so when, when I read the Bible, when I read passages like uh, 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, doesn't envy, doesn't boast. And, and I read that from a lens of, okay, this is what I need to do in order to be a good Christian. I need to not be arrogant. I need to not boast. I need to not, you know, I need to be patient, so on and so forth. When I read it from that lens as a pose, what, what I'm doing when I do that is I'm reading myself as the hero of the story. I'm reading the Bible and I'm saying that, uh, if, if I do these things, then I become the hero of the story, when reality is there's one hero of, of the story, and it's Christ. Christ does not envy. Christ does not boast. Christ's love is patient, and it's kind. And, and yes, we're to emulate that by his grace and by his spirit, but first and foremost, we, we have to read the Bible uh, through this lens, because we all have a tendency to struggle with self-righteousness. We all have a tendency to struggle with uh, our obedience to the law being the means by which God loves us and he welcomes us. And that is antithetical to the gospel message. And so there's, there's comfort in that, but there's also a warning for us who, who have a bent uh, toward, uh, toward religion. It's really important to keep in mind, uh, though, that Christ came to die for the Pharisee as well, right? Christ didn't come to be an enemy of the Pharisee, he came to die for the Pharisee. He came to die for both the religious and the irreligious. Both desperately need the gospel just as much. Because as we're talking about, both are blind. Both are blind. Except for one blindness is motivated by self-righteousness. As we see in verse 15, uh, he, the, the Pharisees say this. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath. Okay? In the Ten Commandments and the Fourth Commandment, God says, honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And so the Pharisees would say that and they'd say, you can't work on it because God told us to honor it and to keep it holy. So a healing is a work. Therefore, because Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath, Jesus couldn't be from God, right? They were missing the point of the law for the law. As we oftentimes do, we miss the point of the Bible for the Bible. Doesn't Jesus say that? He says in John if I can find it, John chapter five, verse 39, he says, you pour over the scriptures because you think that in them you find life, but they testify about me. Think about that. You pour over the scriptures because you think that in them you find life, but they testify about me. The Bible is about Jesus, right? And so we need not miss the point of the Bible for the Bible itself. It's about Jesus. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They couldn't see him because of their own self-righteousness. The, the, oh, here's, I read this. This is very, uh, convicting as well. So there's a Presbyterian minister uh, several centuries ago, I believe, who, who uh, posed this question. He said, what would it look like if Satan took control of a city for one day? Okay, kind of a dark thought. But he says this, what would it look like if Satan took control of a city for one day? And he poses, poses this idea. He says, um, if Satan took over Philadelphia for one day, all of the bars would be closed, pornography would be banished, and pristine streets would be filled with tidy pedestrians who smiled at each other. There would be no swearing, and the children would say, yes, sir, no, ma'am, and the churches would be full every Sunday. You're like, that sounds like the opposite of what I thought it would be if Satan took over a city, but here's how he finishes. The churches would be full every Sunday, but Christ would not be preached. 
What good is it if we look really nice, but we miss Jesus? What, what good is it if we teach morals and we teach our kids how to be good moral people, but we don't share the gospel? We produce Pharisees. It's what the Pharisees did. Nobody was cleaner than the Pharisees on the outside. They read their Bible, they prayed, they went to church, they, I mean, they, they, they taught, they did all of the, they spread the message, they did all of these things, but Jesus says that the Pharisees are producing uh, children of hell that are twice as much as they are in Matthew 23. There's, there's nothing wrong with morality. We need to strive as Christians by the grace of the Holy Spirit to be holy people because God is holy and because he saved us to that. But we need not miss the Messiah for morality. It's dangerous. Oftentimes, I believe self-righteousness in my own life is more dangerous than just blatant sin. It keeps me further from God sometimes. It keeps me from prayer. It keeps me from uh, being desperate for his grace. It keeps me from being reliant upon his Holy Spirit. It makes me think that I'm pretty okay. But I'm not. And so, so we need not allow self-righteousness to produce in us this wickedness that says we don't need the Messiah. That's what the Pharisees did. So the first kind of blindness uh, is those who are blind through self-righteousness. The second kind of blindness is much more optimistic. It's those who are blind but through faith in Christ can now see. Those who are blind but through faith in Christ can now see. This is illustrated by the man. And so as we close, uh, we're, we're going to simply recap on the man's response uh, throughout the course of his interaction with Jesus. Jesus approaches the man and he finds him and he sees him right? And he, he proceeds to reach down and make mud, wipe it in the man's eyes, send him off to the pool to wash. The man comes back seeing. The man's interrogated by the Pharisees. And we see this progression of faith happen throughout the course of the narrative in which the Pharisees ask him, uh, who healed you? And, and at first he says, it's Jesus, but I don't really know anything about him. The second time they ask him, uh, the man proclaims that Jesus is a prophet, and so we see this progression going. He doesn't quite know who Jesus is yet, but he knows there's something special about him. Finally, we see as the story goes on that Jesus uh, says that this man is from God. If he wasn't from God, he wouldn't be able to heal because nobody has ever seen a person who was born blind become unblind. Nobody has ever seen that in the history of the world. He has to be from God, right? And so you see this progression happen. And then when we make it to verse 35, Jesus approaches the man and he says, do you believe in the son of man? Do you believe in the son of man? And the man says this, who is he? Who is he? Jesus answered this, and listen to how beautiful this is compared to, to verse one. Jesus says this, you have seen him. What did the man see in verse one? Nothing. What did he see in verse 36? Everything. He saw Christ. He saw the Messiah. He saw the one who, who had brought healing to his life. For the first time, the man saw. Jesus says, you have seen him. And this is what he goes on to say, and he is the one speaking with you. And the man replies this in verse 38, very simply, uh, I believe, Lord. I believe, Lord. And he worshiped him. You know, the Christian life, and I understand, I'm, I'm younger than some of you guys, but I've lived a little bit of life, and a little bit, and there, there is a mass in our minds, there's such a complexity to the Christian life. What do I do? What does it look like? What are the steps I need to take? What are the practical books I need to read? When the reality is the Christian life is very simply marked by worship that, that flows from a very simple belief in the Son of God. Jesus Christ died for your sin. He died for your sin. God in the flesh came down and died for you. He took all of your sin upon himself. Your past sin, your present sin, your future sin, he took it all upon himself and he bore the weight of the wrath of God on your behalf and on my behalf. And he was buried in the ground and three days later he was resurrected from the dead so that all those who look to him, who see him, uh, could, could be made alive, could be reconciled to God and forgiven of all of our sin. Don't you see the simplicity of the gospel message? And, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for the saints I heard a pastor one time say, do you think you'd ever fear if you heard Jesus praying for you in the other room? What would there be to fear? But that's what he does. That's a, that's a present reality right now. He prays for the saints, for those who trust in him by faith. He intercedes on your behalf. The man worshiped. 
We see this throughout the course of the Bible in the Old Testament uh, with, with Isaiah the prophet as he sees God and all of his holiness for the first time. What does he say? But woe is me for I'm an unclean man filled with a, or among a people of unclean lips. He, he, he comes before God, he sees him for who he is and then God, uh, 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 Isaiah 6 says, atones for his sin. And as a result of atoning for his sin or forgiving him of his sin, Isaiah says, I'll go, send me, I'll go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. Isaiah had probably the hardest mission next to Jeremiah in all of the Bible. The people weren't gonna listen, God told him. They're gonna reject you, they're gonna reject the message, and they're gonna reject me. And Isaiah said, I don't care, I'll go because I've, I've seen the Lord of hosts, right? John, throughout, throughout the New Testament in the book of Revelation, he sees, he sees a glimpse of what Jesus is gonna look like when he comes back with flames of fire in his eyes and a robe dipped in blood and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords tattooed on his side, a side of Jesus that we don't necessarily talk about a lot, but, but it's not the suffering servant anymore. It's now the reigning King who's gonna come back and judge the nations and reconcile and save his bride. This is who he is. Peter falls down as dead before him when, he's tra- when Jesus is transfigured. We see this all throughout the Bible. The beauty and, and the glory of Christ and, and who he is changes us, changes everything about who we are, changes our marriage, changes our parenting, it changes our friendships, it changes, it changes our work ethic, it changes everything. Seeing God, John, John the Baptist says very simply, uh, I love John the Baptist. He says, behold the Lamb of God. See the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Many of you guys know my, my favorite preacher uh, is, it, Kurt, Kurt's up there, but this guy is, uh, is, is a, <clears throat> a guy named Charles Spurgeon who on uh, his salvation story, he stu- on a snowy day, he stumbled into an old Methodist church. There was like 13, 14 people in there. And he sat in the very back and he had just been in misery over his sin leading up to this point. And the, the Methodist preacher, he says at the time was a poor preacher. I mean, just couldn't, couldn't preach anything. And, but kept saying over and over again, look, look and see the Lamb of God. Look and see the Lamb of God. And he said at one point, the preacher actually looked at him, if you can imagine this. And he said, you, sir, you look miserable. Look and see the Lamb of God. And he he said at that point, it's as if all the darkness in his life fled away and he saw the grace and the glory of Christ and the cross for the first time and it changed everything about his life. Right, John Wesley said when, when he heard the preface to Luther's commentary on the book of Romans, the preface, mind you, that it was as if a strange warming fell upon his heart and he experienced the grace of God for the first time, changed everything about his life. This is what the gospel does. It's glorious news. It's glorious news. And it's for the unrighteous and the self-righteous. And so as we come to a close, uh, I, I simply want to encourage you, well, I want to encourage you with a couple of things. Uh, number one, a couple of verses that, going back to point one, Jesus is the light of the world who came to bring sight to those who are blind, so that in him we might walk as children of light. Okay, Jesus said, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. But, but what happened? Jesus went back to be with the Father, didn't he? So who's the light of the world? You and me, if we're in Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, it's better for me to go. Because if I don't go, then the comforter won't come to you. God himself, the Holy Spirit, lives inside of you and lives inside of me. And collectively as the body of Christ, we are now the light of the world. Matthew 5, uh, 14, Jesus says, you are the light of the world to his disciples. The city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and, and give glory to your Father. You're the light of the world. And so this is our admonition today is to very simply believe in the Son of God. If, if you, one of the things that I love so much about Paul Ann is, is the fact that Kurt, and, and this is, I know that this is contingent upon his heart because I was on staff here. He cares about the lost and he wants to see people who are in darkness saved and come to the light. And, and so if you are here today and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, I plead you to do it today. Do it today. Don't wait. Don't keep coming to church thinking that by coming to church, you're going to earn your own righteousness. There's a better way. There's a better way. And it's looking to the Son of God by faith. It's trusting in the Son of God by faith and what he accomplished on your behalf. And if you need to talk to somebody, come talk to me, uh, talk to Willie. I mean, there there are pastors scattered all throughout, elders, uh, Christians. Pull somebody aside and tell somebody that you need to give your life to Jesus Christ today. 
We'll hook you up with a Bible, something. But, but we, would, we would love to hear that, and I, and I plead with you and encourage you to do that. And if you are a believer, I, I simply uh, encourage you to stop trying to earn your own righteousness. Yourself is not righteous. It's very unrighteous. Christ is righteous. So we need to model after uh, the writer of Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan, and say that my righteousness sits at the right hand of the Father. Right? And so, so when, I, when I, by God's grace, see him, when I ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten my heart to the truth of who Christ is, I know that there sits my righteousness. He's already accomplished it. I am righteous in him. No condemnation for those who are in Christ, free from sin and death. Those who believe in Jesus will not die. Though you die, you will not die, right? Praise God. And so we, we get to worship God as we sing. If you're a believer, you get to worship God, not because you came in here after doing well this morning. Most of us didn't do well this morning. We came in grumpy and tired and a mess. We're a mess. And it's okay because he's not. He's everything that we need. And so we worship on the basis of his righteousness alone, not your own. And pray for you guys. Father, we, uh, God, we, we do pray that your spirit would help us to see Jesus and behold him and love him and know his love, God, and rest in his righteousness alone. You are everything, God, that we need. And so help us as the blind man did to simply worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen.